All right. Hey, everyone. People in chat, can you hear me okay? Give a shout out if you can hear me. Sweet. Thank you. All right. So, um, those of you in chat, not sure if you were able to attend last time or catch the recording. Um, if not, that's okay. I uh, just wanted to briefly catch everyone up on where we are leaving off from the first stream. So what we did last time was we created our initial Defender Application Control Policy from scratch, and we focused just on device driver allow lists. And my rationale for wanting to go that route is that I feel considering Defender Application Control gives you the ability to separate out your policy based on kernel versus user mode. I thought that starting with drivers would be the easiest introduction into building a policy from scratch. So why do I say that? That it would be the easiest? Um, just because honestly, uh, the amount of drivers that are being loaded into the OS and post boot so like third party, like hardware drivers and software drivers for say like um, security endpoint sensors, um, that list of drivers is going to be relatively small and it's really not gonna be in flux that much. So I thought that that would be a reasonable place to start. And indeed it was, at least that was my assessment. So we started with the default uh, Windows audit policy, which um, just to jog your memory can be located in C windows, schemas, code integrity, example policies. So there are some great example policies here. And so we started with this one. Um, we did a scrub of what all the relevant components of the XML policy consist of. Um, and then we went down to the bottom where the driver policies were and we tweaked a few things accordingly. So uh, when we first deployed this, I believe the only rule that I removed was this test signer rule, just because honestly that had like no business in our quote unquote, corporate environment um, to have that as an allow list, uh, as an allow rule. So I removed that and deployed it effectively as is. Now, recall another thing I did was I removed the enabled UMCI, again, that stands for user mode code integrity option. And in doing so, While this has user mode code integrity rules, they weren't actually being honored. So this is what allowed us to focus on getting our driver policy right before transitioning into user mode code integrity, which we're gonna do today. And lastly, to jog your memory, one of the issues that we ran into was, so I'm in a, uh, I'm running VMware Fusion on macOS, and uh, this VM guest, um, if you're familiar with Fusion or VMware Workstation, um, has, um, well, it should come as no surprise that there are going to be some VMware related drivers that are executing. And upon initial deployment of this policy, I was expecting those drivers to surface via audit. Um, code integrity events, but they weren't coming up. And after we collectively uh, worked through the issue, it turns out that because the VMware drivers are uh, WQL or WHQL, Windows Hardware Quality Lab, cross-signed by Microsoft, um, they were already implicitly allowed in this list here. Okay, so 
to fix that because I felt that that was overly permissive because I wouldn't want a situation where like um, you may be familiar with like the old school uh, like VBOX driver um, abuse primitive to where you can uh, abuse a vulnerability in that signed driver to load an arbitrary driver. That's the sort of situation that we'd ideally like to avoid. And so we removed that rule. Um, and then it started logging the VMware drivers. And so then based on the code integrity event logs, we pulled out the ones that were surfacing that were related to VMware, copy them to this folder, and then built a policy based on that. And what resulted was the following policy, which I called VMware.xml, okay? And then I took this, merged it using merge-ci policy into my master policy file, and then converted that to a binary form and uh, deployed that. And the test case that I used um, to, to show you that it wasn't working was I had this, um, this read write everything driver, which is a, it's a sign driver um, that effectively allows you to do anything in the kernel uh, from user mode. So while it has legitimate purposes, um, it doesn't have a legitimate purpose on this host that I'm trying to protect. So the, where we left off, uh, I installed it as a service and to validate that my policy was indeed being enforced upon trying to start the service, we indeed got the device guard. Uh, again, device guard is the uh, old term or old product name for Defender Application Control. So we indeed got that prompt there. Um, so at this point, I'm pretty confident that I can effectively block any malicious or suspicious driver that loads via traditional means or doesn't exploit a vulnerability in one of the either OS or VMware related drivers, okay? So, so far so good. Um, if you were in an environment that had a relatively consistent uh, hardware deployment and you were a little apprehensive about whether or not you think uh, Defender Application Control could scale in your environment, you have the option to just take the baby steps of deploying a driver-only policy and seeing where that takes you. So I very much recommend that if you really want to start to, to dabble in Defender Application Control at any level of scale in your environment. Uh, ideally, again, assuming that you have uh, a relatively consistent hardware baseline. But even if you don't, if you simply wanted to get some built-in uh, optics to log uh, what drivers are being loaded, one thing that I might suggest would be to take that default Windows policy here and perhaps do what we did last time and remove the, the WICL rules throw that into audit mode, and then just f start forwarding the code integrity logs to see which drivers are loading in, in your environment, just as a means to supplement your existing optics or detection program. All right. So unless there are any questions there, I'm going to transition over to user mode code integrity. All right. So Fleming asks, uh, do law bins exist for drivers or do they usually just execute themselves? Um, not, not sure I entirely understand the question, um, but I would say that uh, there is no driver equivalent like law bin or law baz project to capture all of these things. Uh, there is a good website um, out there 
There's a project from the, uh, I believe the company name is Eclipsium. Those folks there did, they have a great GitHub repo. I think they called it Screwed Drivers. Um, that is the most extensive reference that I've seen where they track many of the abusable drivers out there. Um, so yeah, the follow-up to the question was, um, yeah, any drivers being able to load other drivers? So if you had a case where you had like a vulnerable driver that could load another driver via traditional means, then Defender Application Control would still protect you. Um, but again, in the case where you have a vulnerable driver that can be exploited such that it could um, effectively like in memory load another driver, uh, Defender Application Control would not protect you in that case. That is until that vulnerability was patched and let me take you back to the VMware driver uh, policy. Like, let's say VM3DMP.sys was vulnerable. All right. Um, this would make our Defender Application Control policy vulnerable to bypass as well. But like with patching any system, right? Like, eventually you're going to expect the next version of VM3 dmp.sys to come out, they'll rev the version number, and then here's where you'd hop in and um, increment the version number to reflect the patched version so that you're not susceptible to like a rollback attack where the where an attacker could drop the old vulnerable version. So um, the folks who designed Defender Application Control were obviously aware of this attack scenario and developed this mitigation accordingly, which I, I, I really like that. Now, as a reminder, you can only create rules based on file name and file version if, and let me go over to um, one of these drivers here, if there's a version re, uh, version info resource available in the PE file. So what do I mean by that? So we right click, go to properties, and go to the details tab. And this is where file version and original file name would need to be populated. So you're gonna run into code, unfortunately, where the developer or whoever was responsible for the software build did not include that. Um, unfortunately, that happens more often uh, than you would hope to see. Um, but you just have to be mindful of that. And that's an opportunity to reach out to that respective vendor and tell them to uh, start including that information. <clears throat> because otherwise you're left to creating an allow list based solely on signer which might be acceptable to some. Uh, it's generally not acceptable to me. I, I personally consider that to be overly permissive. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum, you could create an allow list based on file hash, which, cre uh, which is very secure, but it creates a maintenance burden. Okay, cool. All right. So what I wanted to do for user mode code integrity was just work with the existing VM I have and uh, just employ a realistic scenario where I say, well, uh, I want to take all the software that I plan on running in my gold image, quote unquote, um, and build rules around that. So. Last week, you saw me using Vim a bit. Um, so why don't we build a policy for that? Another tool that I like is called CFF Explorer. I mentioned last week that that's one of my favorite uh, free PE parsing utilities. So uh, why don't we start with one of these? And then time permitting, we might go into a second one. And so this is the process that I would go about uh, building these policies, I would consider 
every piece of third party software that I have. And I would build a dedicated policy for each software installation. Now that might not be acceptable for everyone. Um, that could create a, a burden in just a, a configuration and a deployment burden in trying to assess that. But um, on the, the upside to that approach is that I think it's nice to have an XML code integrity policy per software installation because it, it decreases my maintenance burden over time. And so like if, um, if one piece of software was updated, then I only have to update a single small policy. And then when I'm ready to uh, build and deploy the master policy, I can just take all those separate policies, merge them into a single one, and then deploy that. So for me, it, it not only decreases my maintenance burden, but it also allows me to really dig into understanding what the file footprint or the, the disk footprint is of my software installations. Uh, question was, can, can I share the XML files I reference in my GitHub repo? Um, most likely, yes. So um, where, now you may be referring to the repo that I started recently called WDAC policies, I believe. So I started this repo WDAC policies and here in the policies directories, um, I've started with VMware tools. So um, I'm running VMware tools in this VM and I've got a policy to reflect that. Um, and, you know, in the, the age of coronavirus and working from home, I thought it would be valuable to have policies for some of the popular um, teleconferencing uh, suites out there. So, so I got Teams and, and Zoom in there. And also um, you'll see this come up when you start working with um, application control a lot is that a lot of software installations take a dependency on the Microsoft Visual C runtime. Now that is Microsoft signed, it's not Windows signed. So if your policy states that only Microsoft code, or sorry, only only inbox uh, Windows signed code can run, then um, it could be a good idea to have a, a policy that's dedicated to just allowing the, the C runtime. Again, you'll probably find that my methodology is a little more aggressive than most would be. Many would find that it is perfectly acceptable to blanket allow all Microsoft code to run. Um, I just don't carry the same level of trust. I trust Windows sign code a little more than I do Microsoft sign code because I've seen that pretty much anyone at Microsoft uh, can get their arbitrary code signed with a Microsoft certificate, but that Windows code signing certificate is, is quite special and uh, much more restrictive. All right. So uh, to answer your question, can I include these policies that I generate for Explorer Suite and Vim? Um, Let's just see what they look like uh, when we're done, and then we'll we'll cross that bridge once we get there. All right. So why don't we start with with Vim? First thing I might do is see if the installer is actually signed. Boo! It's not. Uh, this isn't super uncommon, but um, it's unfortunate. Um, the best policies that we can generate would be based on signers from the perspective of alleviating maintenance burden, right? So um, I suspect that if the installer is not signed, then perhaps the 
uh, all of the files that are going to be installed as well may not be signed as well. That may not necessarily be true, but that's just my suspicion. All right. Now, uh, I want to run this installer. Um, but then, like, let, let's step back a little bit. If we're, go if we're going to create an allow list for Vim, what are we going to create an allow list for? And in particular, if nothing is signed, then what are we going to create allow lists for? So we're going to need to determine exactly which files or which executable code is associated with Vim. And honestly, this is easier said than done. It's not, it, it isn't necessarily intuitive. And so I'm going to share some strategies that I use to uh, answer the question of what is the disk footprint of any arbitrary software installation. So I'm going to switch over to my elevated prompts and we're going to look at a utility called package inspector. So this is a cool built in utility. Uh, it's in system 32 and what it does is it does it performs a file trace during software installation so you tell it to start the trace and you can optionally point it to the installer file you do the installation and then you stop the trace and upon stopping it it will generate a list of all the files that all the executable files that were created as a part of that installation. So there's one really good way to get a quick sense of what the disk footprint is for any given software installation. So um, why don't we start with that? And then once we get a sense of what all is involved with the Vim installation, then we could start assessing what our options would be for building a policy and then and only then will we uh, take that generated policy and merge it into a master policy and deploy it in audit mode and see where that takes us all right so to start we're just going to read the documentation here and do package in inspector start and then we do, we have to specify the drive letter. Okay, so we're gonna do C colon and specify the, again, this is optional, the path to the installer, but I don't want my trace to be exceptionally noisy. Oops. Uh, my installer is here. And that should be it. Okay. So that trace is running. I'm going to run through the installer now. All right. I'm just going to go with these defaults. Or you know what? Yeah, sometimes when I'm building a policy, I'll just do the full installation so that uh, to minimize the likelihood that I would miss any executable files that I would otherwise want to create an allow list for. And honestly, as an attacker, I really like to go through this process too, because this can inform follow on offensive research. For example, who knows, like, well, I would, I certainly don't consider myself to be a Vim expert to know, like, are there any scripting components built into it? Um, are there any insecure libraries? Are there any executables 
that could be used to execute arbitrary unsigned code, right? Like you can't even begin to answer those questions until you have a sense of what the disk footprint is of a potential uh, research target like this. So um, this, this process is, is definitely a win-win whether you're on the red or the blue side. All right, so installation completed and we're going to run this again. We're gonna stop the trace. Uh, so we do stop and then drive letter again. And we specify the type of file we want. Uh, I like to do a list uh, because I'm not building a catalog file. Like I don't, I don't care about these two file formats. CDF is, I think it stands for catalog definition format. Uh, it's like it's a special formatted text file to aid in building catalog files. Uh, I just want the raw list of files. So I'm gonna do dash out list, and then you gotta do uh, list path. And we'll give it our full path here. Oops. Ah. Uh, we'll call this gvim files.txt. Sometimes it takes a few seconds to, to run. And then, so I would, I'm starting to get into the habit of running package inspector for every software installation that I do. Um, whether I'm building a policy for it or not, if I just want to get a sense of what the disk footprint is. So let's check out that. Oops, a wrong file. All right, cool. Uh, that was a significantly shorter list than I expected. All right, now uh, one last consideration here is, and fortunately it was listed in here, is uh, this has bitten me before. I've gone and built a policy for a software installer that, that had a an uninstaller that I didn't account for that wasn't signed. And so upon trying to uninstall the software installation, Defender Application Control prevented me from doing so. So you do need to be mindful of, uh, of that, uh, of capturing the uninstaller in your policy. Uh, question, is Twitch, Twitch stream usually available to watch later or is this only live stream? Uh, it will be available uh, on Twitch for, uh, I think, six days or seven days. Um, but I also upload these to YouTube as well. So you'll be able to, so no, don't feel obligated to stick around for the full two hours. I, I certainly wouldn't expect most people to, but, but thanks for, uh, for joining while you can. All right. So cool. Here's what I would do next. Um, I'm going to take this and we noted previously that the installer was not signed. I'd like to know if any of the installed files were signed. So let's try to pipe this list to get authentic code signature. And unfortunately, none of this is signed. Now I say unfortunately, like maybe it's not a big deal. I don't personally know the frequency with which 
any of these library files are or executables are updated uh, I would I, I don't know maybe like do some Google searches to see if any of these related files uh, if there have been any reported vulnerabilities in them um, just to kind of gauge like how often these are updated um, and I'm curious because because none of these are signed, uh, it's going to make generating our policy like super simple, uh, but it's going to have to be by file hash, unfortunately. Um, now that's not the only option. One of the later features, or one of the, one of the more recent features in Defender, uh, excuse me, in Defender Application Control is that you can create an allow list based on file path. So I believe the, the rationale here was in the interest of trying to achieve feature parity with AppLocker, which allows you to do that um, at the cost of uh, decreased security, this feature was, was made available. So um, you could create a policy that specified that uh, anything within C program files Vim Vim eighty two uh, would be allowed. And honestly, like I I certainly wouldn't judge anyone for doing that. Um, and the reason is is because it's installed into program files. So assuming that this is a uh, Ackled properly, like we could validate this real quick. So C program files, Vim, look at the um, the discretionary access control and just do a quick sanity check to see if they're, so I would look at like users, right? Um, are they allowed to write anything? No, they're not. Okay, so only administrators and trusted installer and just, uh, uh, elevated principles are allowed to write anything to this directory. So I would say it would be perfectly reasonable to create a policy based on that. Um, me personally, as someone who prefers to err on the side of uh, security over convenience, I would like to create a policy based on hash. All right. Um, we, we could certainly argue back and forth about the, the merits of one approach over another. Uh, this, but you're honestly not going to reasonably come to um, the same conclusion that other people will because we, we all have varying levels of trust. All right. Uh, yeah, Malt Yeah, certainly. Um, you can use access check to um, to validate the access control list of these files. And so like, the, again, from like a security research perspective or offensive perspective, um, now that we have this list, we know where everything is installed. Again, like we could not care about application control and just be like, oh, can I abuse anything with XXD or Vim run? Like that sounds interesting. Win PTI, PTY agent, like, you know, um, we have lots of opportunities here. Um, and then we can also do a quick assessment of the uh, file and folder security as well using something like access check, or if we're gonna stick with uh, strictly PowerShell, we have something built in already that we wouldn't have to create uh, and allow rule for. All right. So to get that similar information, you you do have you do have this at your disposal. So you can dig into the access property, and um, the uh, well, the, this is a subject for another time as to how you would how you interpret the file system rights when the, uh, when the enum doesn't parse properly. Um, well, we, we could save that for, for another day. All right. But th that, that's a great point. 
uh, we could certainly use some automation to, uh, to, to automate assessing uh, ACL uh, potential vulnerabilities. All right. All right, so let's, let's build our policy for GVIM. So what I'm gonna do is, um, actually, sorry, I wanna go back. I wanna go back to the list and validate that these are all contained within the same directory. And I think I'm going to exclude my installer from my policy um actually i'm gonna do this i'm just gonna validate the file hash of my installer and see if it matches the gvim dot no it, yeah it wouldn't match gvim dot um sorry I'm, I'm going back and forth here as to whether or not to include that actually i think we should include that because um we're not gonna like it's not gonna be be very practical to get to a system that is enforcing policy only to try to install the installer and it won't let us but we've allowed all these subsequent installed files to be installed like that doesn't really make much sense um, but just as a sanity check let me see if um, let me see if install.exe is is a match here. Oops. Yeah, it's not. So I'm leaning towards uh, we should include the installer. So I'm just going to do this temporarily for the sake of simplicity. I'm going to copy copy this to C program files vim. So that I can point get system driver to that directory from which we can build a policy. All right, so let's do this. We'll do. I'll just call this files, and then uh, we used this last time. Get system driver. This pulls signer information for files, but because these aren't signed, it's just going to pull some file metadata that we're gonna that we're gonna want to supply new dash CI policy to actually build policy. So we're going to point our scan path to C program files vim. And we want to account for user PEs. Again, this being a user mode code integrity policy. Um, I'm just going to say no script. I don't see any script code in here. Well, Actually, it might not hurt to just not have that in there. And I usually do no shadow copy. I don't, I'm not worried about there being locked files that I won't be able to get a handle on in this case. Um, so I don't need to create a shadow copy just to get this information. All right, so it's going to recursively scan through everything there. Wow, that's a lot of files. Again, Vim, Vim noob here. So when this is done, I'll take the objects that are returned and I'll pass them to new CI policy. Um, this came up in a Twitter thread last week after I did this. Whereas pointed out that that was a little redundant because you can also point a scan path. Uh, you can specify a scan path in new dash CI policy. But what I found is that there will often be cases where user mode code is mistakenly interpreted as a device driver. And there's a property in the objects returned from get system driver that allow me to filter that out. So like, here's what one of these objects look like. 
And here's the issue. This is what I want to avoid. So when user mode is set to false, that means that when you supply this object to new CI policy, it's going to add that rule to a uh, to the driver policy, which I don't want. All right, so um, just want to get a sense of how many files there are here. Okay, twenty three. That seems like a the number I would be expecting. Um, but let's let's do this. Let's do files where objects user mode. So this implies that user mode equals true. All right. So you see user mode is true. And then, ah, sorry. All right. So I'm going to save this. We'll call this uh, user mode files. All right. So we went from 23 to 21. So there were there were two files that were mistakenly interpreted as uh, driver code. So uh, I want to avoid that because I know like this is all user mode code. All right. So we've got a comment here. When you call ex allocate pool, does the page protection values get stored somewhere else other than just a page table such as a VAD tree? Uh, it <laughs> That's a good question. It's been a long time since um, I've done anything with like page tables and, and the VAD tree. Um, so from, uh, I assume you're asking the question from like a, um, a defender application control, like evasion perspective, like if you had a primitive to, um, like if, if you were able to exploit a vulnerable driver and flip a bit in the VAD tree to say like, hey, no, this uh, this memory page is actually read, write, execute um, to know if that would be possible. Um, to be honest, I'm, I'm pretty ignorant to what the, the latest and greatest mitigations are around that. My gut understanding is that hypervisor code integrity and uh, VBS or virtualization based protected uh, code integrity. If you enable those features and defender application control should protect you from that. Um, but I could very well be wrong. Uh, person to ask would probably be Dave Weston on Twitter. But that's a good question. I like where you're going with that. All right, so let's build this policy now. And again, I, I, I think the, the naming of some of these commandlets is just unfortunate. So get dash system driver. Again, it doesn't apply to just drivers. It's any executable code. And then dash driver files, again, unfortunately named. This just refers to the output from get system driver, which in this case is comprised of just user mode code. All right, so we need to specify our XML policy file. Uh, we'll call this gvim.xml. And now we need to specify the, um, the policy level. And PowerShell being handy because this um, this argument is an enum type. I can just I can tab through this stuff, and um, all all of these options are are documented. But because these are all unsigned, and I decided against using a path based policy, uh, I wanted to go with file hash. Okay, so that's what the hash level refers to, and I think that's it. Yep. All right, so that completed successfully. And now um, let's look at our, let's do a quick sanity check of our policy.
So what you'll find uh, often is when you do a hash policy for every file, you'll get you'll usually get four uh, rules per file. Uh, you'll get two file rules and then two uh, page hash rules. And I desperately asked uh, the, the Twitterverse um, to help me out in defining what a page hash is. And there's a thread there somewhere. And uh, I, I recall uh, Joe Bialik at, at Microsoft gave the, the best explanation of what these are, um, but I'm not even gonna do it justice. This has to do with um, when a page is, um, I believe like swapped into memory or like committed in memory, there's a different type of, of hash um, that's done on that memory page versus the, the file hash itself. Um, so just know that these are included uh, as well. Um, my understanding is that page hashes really are generally only applicable to um, to drivers and to uh, protected processes. Uh, I could be wrong, but I'm, I'm not the expert on that here. All right, so we have all these, these uh, hash rules. And an, another sanity check that I'll do is ensure that all of these user mode uh, rules are applied to the following or are applied to the right policy. In this case, the user mode policy. So this one here and not my driver policy. Okay, cool. So now what do we do with this? So we want to deploy it and test it in this environment. Uh, Sorry, so the question is, what exactly is this gonna accomplish? Um, I assume you're referring to the policy that I just built and what that is going to accomplish. Um, if that is what you're referring to, then uh, you'll, you'll see the, the answer here once I actually deploy the, the policy. Um, if that's not the case, then uh, yeah, feel, feel free to, to elaborate. All right. So like last time, we're going to start with a base policy because we need Windows to boot. We need the drivers to boot and we need all the user mode OS code to be permitted to execute. So we need to start with a base policy before we can even consider allowing our GVIM policy. So Let's step away from the GVIM stuff for a little bit and go back to the original policy that we were working with last week. All right. So let's go here and we're going to copy C Windows sorry, uh, schemas, example policy, uh, code integrity example policies and copy that default Windows audit policy over to our desktop and we're, we're going to work with that. So we're just going to do this, this process from scratch, sort of like what we did last time. Now because I don't have, uh, well I do have Vim installed, but we're just going to roll without it until our policy is, is in place. Okay, so we're going to start enforcing UMCI, user mode code, integ code integrity. So we want this option left in there. All right. And now let's start scrubbing through this here. Um, let's go back to our driver policy and remove those uh, WICL rules. So I'm going to remove it from here. And then I want to remove those, I want to remove the test signing one too. I think there's one in here as well. Yeah, and the user mode policy. I'm gonna re remove that. 
and then I'm going to remove the corresponding signer rules in my policy. And then I need to find those WICWL or Windows Hardware Quality Lab rules, the ones that corresponded to our drivers. Okay, which were these here. All right. Because what I want to do is I want to have this base policy, which just allows Windows user and kernel mode code to execute and nothing else. And then supplement this policy with my VMware policy and my GVIM policy, and then whatever extra software I want to allow. Oops. All right. All right. Now let's look at the user mode rules again and see if there's anything that we might want to remove from here. Um, if this was a production system where we didn't want to allow Windows Insider preview code, we'd want to remove these flight rules. So flight signing, my understanding is that it refers to anything uh, related to Windows Insider preview builds. Um, and then everything else, uh, realistically, we're just going to want to leave it as is. So for the sake of this demonstration and our time, let's just leave this as is and then add to it accordingly. All right. So why don't we get started by just deploying this? So we'll take our default policy and we're going to convert it to the, uh, the binary format, which is that sipolicy.p7b file. But we're going, so in addition to converting it to binary, in the same step, we're going to deploy it. And so to deploy it, you copy it to C Windows System 32, Code Integrity, SIPolicy.p7b. Okay. And because we just made such a drastic change to the policy, um, to the base policy, like this Windows policy, here's where I would feel most comfortable rebooting. Now, you don't have to reboot. Uh, if, if you're making like just minor changes, but um, just for the sake of simplicity and wanting to assess all of the files that I maybe didn't account for in my policy, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna reboot now. Uh, question: What happens in uh, Windows 10 build 2021 with signed drivers? I don't have a good answer to that. I'm not really completely up to date on what the proposed uh, enforcement measures are. If you have any insight into that, uh, certainly share, because um, I'd certainly be keen to, to know. Okay, so let's restart. And hopefully nothing gets bricked here. We had really good luck last time with our driver policy, which we eventually placed into enforcement mode. I was pretty impressed by that. And once we reboot, we're going to use that uh, audit script that I wrote that's included in the WDAC tools uh, PowerShell module that I wrote, it's in GitHub, to start auditing the code integrity events. All right, so uh, with 2021, as of right now, you can just get a 10-year-old vulnerable driver and use it to load any unsigned driver you want. Um, so that won't be the case with a Defender Application Control policy that's enforcing a driver policy. 
So if you're only allowing Windows signed drivers, and so like in our scenario, we're just allowing Windows signed drivers to run and VMware drivers to run, anything outside of that will not be permitted to execute per policy. So even if I um, presumably enabled test signing mode, Defender Application Control would still enforce that, is my understanding. Now, an exception to that would be made if you're, um, if you're performing kernel mode debugging. Um, Defender Application Control is no longer um enforced at that point but in order to do kernel mode debugging you have to configure um, the boot configuration which if you have secure boot enabled you won't be able to enable kernel mode debugging so you'd have to disable secure boot in that case in which case upon disabling secure boot you've lost you've pretty much lost the enforcement guarantees that Defender Application Control offers you. So hopefully that clarifies some things. Oh, there's that annoying bug again. So I bring up the standard shell and restart. I got to figure that out. That's just weird. All right, cool. So Let's run our audit script. Uh, do I know a good place to scrape drivers? Um, my privileged answer would be uh, if you have access to VirusTotal uh, to, to pull files, then that's an option. Otherwise, I don't know a good place to consistently obtain abusable drivers. That'll be on you, sorry. <laughs> okay, so get WDAC code integrity event. And just as a sanity check, I wanna just look at the kernel code integrity rules because I did not include the VMware drivers. So I wanna just validate that those are actually included in my events here. Just to confirm that the policy deployed as expected. Okay, so yeah, it looks like it worked. So it's in audit mode currently. Yep, VMCI. Yeah, those are those VMware drivers, which I have not merged into my base policy yet. So cool. Now with the built-in um, filtering that I have here, now that I've looked at the kernel rules, I'm just going to start looking at the user mode rules. Now here's where things should start getting interesting and a little more noisy. All right. So we got 76 events. Um, honestly, that's actually not that bad. Like uh, this. So the only user mode code that is allowed currently is Windows signed code. And there's only 76 events that fall outside of that. I'm actually kind of impressed that that's it. So let's start digging into what these events are. All right. So the first one is going to be a super common source of noise in your code integrity logs. When you redeploy a policy, um, so there's something called NGEN. Thing, uh, refers to like native image generation. It's a performance enhancement for .NET. So when most .NET code runs, um, it's not the it's not the original .NET code or .NET assembly that is executing. In most cases, it is that .NET assembly that has been converted to native uh, assembly code. Um, so x86 or x64 for performance reasons. 
And in the process of generating those native images, or in the case of uh, PowerShell here, what you'll see is any, any .NET binary that has been converted to a native image will be like .NET executable .exe would be .NET executable .ni.exe, or in the case of this DLL, uh, Microsoft WSMAN.management.dll is going to be management.ni.dll. All right. Oh man, OJ just made it. Hey man, thanks a lot for joining. Uh, as, as I mentioned last time, gave OJ a good shout out. He was, I, I really credit OJ to, uh, for being the, the motivation behind me starting the stream and just being an awesome guy in general. Great friend, even though haven't met you yet uh, in person. Love you, buddy. Hey, Sonny, good to see you again, dude. Yeah, I'm really, really starting to love and uh, appreciate my my small but, but growing audience here. Uh, question, do I know if Windows Defender has measures against VMP3? Uh, I don't know what VMP3 is, so I don't have a good answer for you there. Sorry. Um, all right. So anyway, here's the first source of noise that you're going to get. Anything related to that NGEN service, that native image generation, is going to be noise that you're going to need to filter out. All right. So we'll take that into account. And um, what I'd like to do is just list out the resolved file path for all these events. And then I will sort that to kind of get a sense of what all is being loaded here that I will that I may want to account for in user mode policies. All right. Oh, now here's the other thing. Uh, well, so we have a little bit of GVim loading, and this is the GVim shell extension, presumably, because like I didn't explicitly load GVim, um, but the sh uh, the shell extension did. So right. So what was the shell extension? If if we don't know, uh, like when you right click a file, it showing edit with Vim implies that. That, uh, that shell extension was loaded into, uh, it should be Explorer. All right. So there are some of those Vim artifacts there. Now, what was not accounted for was Vim itself. Hey, I'm a hacker, right? I know how to exit Vim. I got street cred. All right. So here, let's uh, create or let's uh, let's run that audit script again, and just as a sanity check, the one true editor. Yes, OJ, I'm uh, only recently starting to discover that, but uh, have to say I'm uh, starting to get into that camp. I'm I'm really liking it. Although VS Code is awesome, but uh, damn, like I I tried to build an application control policy for VS Code and. I table flipped multiple times. That's the sort of thing. And like just developer IDEs, like in general, whew, um, I, my, my recommendation is like, if you really want to get good about deploying application control, this is one of those cases where I would consider just putting your development tools into a dedicated uh, development VM and just having those tools running in there just because uh, with the churn of building and running and testing code and the massive environment, massive and extensible environment that is an IDE, uh, in my opinion, it's not really realistic to be building uh, pol uh, application control policies for those things. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with telling developers to uh, create their own dev sandbox in, in a VM in an otherwise uh, very locked down environment. All right. Uh, so when I ran Vim, uh, we did indeed get some of those extra 
uh, rules in there. All right, so what I'd like to do now is we're just considering adding our Vim policy to the base uh, policy, the base Windows policy. So let's go ahead and do that now. All right, so we're gonna call merge CI policy and we're gonna call our merged policies merged dot XML and point to our policy paths, which are currently, we got our defaults one here. And remember what I said last time about merge CI policy, the order in which you specify your policies is very important. The first policy that you specify is the one that is gonna retain the file rule options. So what do I mean by file rule options? I mean this, these here. So I want, uh, so like you can have different file rule options and different policies, but because you're merging them together, uh, merging these rules doesn't exactly make sense. Merging signer rules absolutely makes sense, like combining those, but com combining like overall Defender application control configuration options like just doesn't make sense. So the first policy that you specify is gonna um, is gonna keep its rule options, and all others will not be considered. All right. So that's important. Okay. Could not find file. Oh yeah. We need to give it the actual XML file there. Okay, quick sanity check. Let's look at merged.xml. And I will scroll to the bottom here. And this looks like it's probably our user mode policy. Yep, which indeed it is. In addition to the driver policy that we had. So, Quick sanity check. This looks like it will account for the gym pol uh, the the GVim policy that we created. And now we want to deploy it. So let me fire up a an elevated prompt prompt here. Since we need to be elevated to actually deploy this thing. And we need to, what did we do? Oh yeah, we just created the um, the XML. So we got to, well, let me just do this from scratch. Convert from CI policy, give it merged.xml. And then the binary file path is gonna be C windows, system32, code integrity, SI policy.p7b, we're gonna overwrite the existing one. And a quick sanity check here. Here in merged, I want to validate that this is specified, update policy, no reboot. So this is not gonna, just by me overwriting SI policy.p7b, uh, code integrity is not going to automatically update itself, uh, we have to compel it to update itself. And um, here's kind of the annoying bit. So we need to use WMI to do this. And if you're like me, you don't remember WMI classes and methods and arguments to run, like you don't have those down to memory unless like unless you do like lateral movement all the time in which case you're probably calling the win32 process create method um, but aside from that like wimmy class methods are hard to memorize um, but i've got in my wdac tools um, policy here so it's here in wdac auditing.ps1 this is also on uh, microsoft documents this uh this as well but I've got this handy in here. 
here at the bottom. And I have code to automate this whole process. Like I'm going through the harder steps right now, like the more manual process to show you like how to do this manually. Um, eventually we'll work our way up to using the WDAC tools module to automate the merging and deployment and configuration of these policies. All right, so OJ question. Does this result in the possibility of a whitelist bypass because Vim does have plugins and extensions that you can sire those in on the fly? Or would this policy stop that and force people to whitelist the extra components? Um, yeah, so <laughs> uh, it's probably, yeah, on, on the wire, yeah. So um, this is probably a few minutes before you, you joined OJ. I. Um, I mentioned like me being the the Vim noob, not really uh, knowing like the level of extensibility that Vim has to know like what I should realistically be able to account for. And so when I ran package inspector to get a sense of like what all the files, oh no, no worries, <laughs> no, no need to apologize. Uh, it's, a, it's a good reminder. Um, so when I ran package inspector to assess what all files were installed uh, upon running the, the full installer for GVim, this is what came up, right? So um, seeing as like you're saying it has like a, a pluggable, like extensible architecture, um, yeah, we, we would need to account for that in our policy. Um, but as it stands, like if those are DLLs or like if those extensions are PE files or script files, we haven't accounted for those in policy. And so by default, they won't be permitted to execute. So we would have to explicitly allow those unless it's some like scripting, uh, some like script host that is not Defender application control aware, right? So like, um, Defender application control is not going to do you any good if you create an allow rule for Python or Ruby or Java, right? Because all those uh, scripting or dynamic code environments uh, are not def uh, are not code integrity aware. Cool, great question. But OJ, your assignment is to consider this list here and find all the lull bins or lull DLLs, whatever, that permit arbitrary unsigned code execution. All right, so there you go. Oh, so Vim does have a rather awful scripting language uh, huh, that could possibly allow a bypass, yeah. Huh. Well, you should, yeah, you should totally dig into that. Um, the ugliness of a scripting language should never stop an attacker from pursuing abuse. So OJ, yeah, <laughs> I'm all about those uh, lol, lol vims. <laughs> cool. All right. So, all right, we got our merge policy, but where we left off, we need to actually update the policy, ideally without having to reboot. So where do I have that in here? I have, um, sorry, this is boring. Um, Okay, um, where were we? Oh no, it's, it's in build and deploy policies. This is computer hacking at, at its best here. Watching other people scroll through ugly code. Okay, deploy and update. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna copy this out. Okay, so the 
The WMI class that we care about is called this. Again, this is documented. Uh, Microsoft documents this. And the WMI namespace that it lives in is this. The method, the WMI class method we want to call is update. And we specify the full path to what we want to update. So in this case, should be uh, C Windows System32 SI Policy. All right. And throw that into here. And we got a return value of zero indicating success. Um, so just so you know, next time as a human, like you can actually read like that zero in, does indicate success, which means that, well, it means a couple things. We updated our policy and here's where this, uh, this handy switch comes in play for get WDAC code integrity events uh, since last policy refresh. So by me calling that WMI method, it creates its own dedicated event in the event log, which I look for in this function. Uh, and so that's why I supported that, that switch there. Um, I don't care about any of the old uh, rules at this point. Like I want to validate that upon refreshing the policy that the Vim related files do not show up in my code integrity policy. All right. So with that, Let's fire up Vim. Again, I'm a computer hacker because I know how to exit Vim. Um, and then actually, well, it's at this point that we should probably do um, capture those events again. Okay. Underrated joke indeed. All right. All right, so, oh, well, that explains that. Cool. All right, well, so here's one of those uh, false positives from the, the NGEN service, all right? Uh, this stands out because it's ni.dll or ni.exe. Um, and we don't have any of the Vim events. So yay, we created an allow list for our first user mode code. So, so far so good, right? Um, another thing to consider here is So we're still in full language mode. Um, what should be the case when you deploy a user mode policy, is that script enforcement should be in place, but it's not. So what do I mean by that? Let's look at Set rule option help. So there's one related to script enforcement. And because I didn't explicitly disable that, I would have expected script enforcement to be in place, in which case the language mode should automatically be constrained language. Now, I don't know if we need another reboot for that to take effect or not. Um, but fortunately, um, the audit scripts, the audit and deployment scripts in, um, in the WDAC tools module um, uh, run perfectly fine in constrained language mode. Like they run within the constraints of constrained language mode. Uh, and there's no special like .NET stuff that they require uh, last time I checked. 
Um, but we'll, we'll certainly want to figure that out moving forward. But at this point, um, I would say let's, let's continue the process here of creating whitelists or sorry, creating allow lists for user mode code such that the only events that we get are the, um, are these NGEN related ones, which we don't have to care about because the, um, I don't know the actual implementation of um, like code integrity to know exactly how it is that Windows and the kernel is allowing uh, these unsigned files to run, but they do. Like, uh, when I know that Windows is NGEN or uh, like that native image generation aware, and it allows these specific uh, like NGEN process to permit um, execution of these NGEN files. Um, but that that's uh, that's some research and a discussion for another day. But just know that they are allowed to run, even though they're not signed and they're not explicitly permitted per policy. Although they are implicitly permitted per policy because the, the original um, executables are signed, are Windows signed, right? Um, but the native image is unsigned, but still allowed to execute, which is probably a good thing just for performance reasons. But from a bypass perspective, I would ask someone like James Forshaw about how to potentially abuse uh, native image generation. All right, so where do we go from here? Why don't we consider the totality of all the user mode code that has tried to execute and then assess what we have not accounted for? All right, so don't care about these. Uh, these are interesting. Right, so these are related to the Microsoft C runtime library. And these are not permitted to run. Well, they were, but they're audited and would otherwise have been blocked because these are Microsoft signed and not Windows signed. These are not included in the OS. All right. So we'll want to account for those because the idea here is we're eventually going to want to place this thing into uh, into enforcement mode, all right? But we're not ready for that yet because look at all the VMware tools stuff that we have here, okay? Um, this is stale stuff, uh, all, the, all the Vim related stuff, but um, this doesn't look terrible. Hey, what's up Arch Archbishop? Thanks for joining. Ooh, got another Aussie here. At least two Aussies. I'm loving this. Okay, so um, this doesn't look too terrible. So we got Vim, GVim. We've already accounted for that. We're going to want to account for VMware tools. We're going to want to account for VMware drivers. Fortunately, we already have a policy for that from last week. Okay, whoa. I just saw dark mode in here. Where did I see that? dark mode sync. Oh man. That is awesome. Okay. Um, and then the other thing, yeah, the only other thing we wanted to account for was just the C runtime library. All right. Um, so here's where I'm going to cheat in the interest of time. Um, and I'm going to pull up the code that I use to generate the policies for uh, the C runtime library and for VMware tools uh, from my GitHub repo. Okay. All right, so let's start with VMware tools. So I created a policy for this. 
But if I were you, I would not just take my policy and go deploy it and merge it into your policy. I would build this thing from scratch. This was just really for like demonstration purposes to kind of give you a sense of what would be included in a realistic uh, VMware policy. But I've got this um, supplemental markdown here and I supply the code that I use to build my policy. So I've never actually tried to replicate this on another host. So um, what better opportunity than now to, uh, to try this out? Um, okay, so let's copy that in there. Let's do a quick scrub of things here. Um, I was particularly careful here in building this policy. So I also built it to account for the installer, right? So like when you go to um, in VMware, like Workstation or Fusion, like install VMware tools, it mounts the VMware like installation ISO for you. So I wanted to account for that. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do that here just in the interest of uh, simplicity and, and time. Um, but I do want to capture drivers. Okay, I want to capture drivers. I want to capture user mode code. I want to get rid of these disk variables because we're not accounting for the mounted ISO, okay? And let's just try that. All right. Oops. Okay. Computering is hard here. Okay, so what it's doing now is it is scanning through uh, program files, comma files, VMware, which um, using the same methodology that I used previously, like using package inspector to identify the disk footprint for uh, the, the VMware tools installation, I determined that um, much of the VMware code was installed to the common files VMware directory. And so I'm pointing get system driver to that. And then it's getting all the signer information. Okay. So Sonny is asking, do we need to account for anything in program data? I don't recall. Uh, in this case, I don't believe so. For the, in the case of VMware, uh, the answer is no. And again, I am confident in that assessment because I ran package inspector and validated that there was no uh, code installed to program data. In the case of, uh, in that WDAC policies repo for uh, Teams and Zoom, uh, those do indeed install to program data. But again, we, we would uh, make this determination ideally by running our installers with the um, the package uh, package inspector trace running, All right? All right, let's see, VMware tools. Let's see if that just automatically works. How cool would that be? Oh, boo. All right, let's see. Um, so you'll often get these, these errors. So this tells you like based on the rule levels that you specify, something could not be accounted for. Okay, so it couldn't account for this MSI, comreg.exe, VPS, and those things. That's interesting. Um, so file publisher and hash. See, 
I was expecting this to work because I specified hash. Um, what if I changed, changed it to this? This could be, this could possibly be a, a bug. Okay, yeah, so I think that's a bug in, um, I assumed that you could specify multiple fallbacks here, but that may not be the case. Um, so instead of using Wiccal File Publisher, we're just doing uh, File Publisher. Um, but we've already accounted for those Wiccal File Publisher rules from last week with the, with the VMware driver policy that we made. So here, why don't we do this? Why don't we um, tweak this a little bit and not account for any driver rules? So let's remove drivers from here. And then I'll call this VMware Tools user. Yeah, we'll go with that. Um, change this to file publisher and then change our fallback to just hash. Um, before I do that, actually, why don't we, I, I think it would be valuable to show you what's wrong with some of these files. So what is wrong with, let's go with comreg.exe. What is wrong with that? Why can't we build a file publisher rule based on comreg.exe? Um, all right, so let's do this. Get item on that file. Oops, wrong one. So let's copy that. Okay. So here's why. There is no embedded version info resource. So there isn't this, the metadata present in the binary, in this case, comreg.exe, whatever that is, I assume it is related to com registration. Um, it's not in there. So we can't use the original file name and file version as the basis to build a signer rule, which is, a, which is unfortunate. So, this is one of those cases where uh, this this file happens to be uh, to be signed. All right, so I could do get authentic code signature on that, and you can see it is indeed signed by uh, by VMware in this case. So we could either just blanket allow all VMware code to run, which again would could be acceptable to to many. Um, or we could allow comreg.exe to run by hash if we want to err on the side of greater security. All right. Uh, Sunny asks, are there any other prerequisites required like version info for file publisher? Um, by default, the two requirements for file publisher are original file name and file version. Now you can, um, because I, I reported this as uh, uh, this is a, a device card bypass to Microsoft ages ago. Uh, I believe it was, yeah, it was Matt Nelson who found that you could use the F sharp interpreter, FSI.exe, to execute arbitrary unsigned code. So that was really cool. Um, and I believe he did a blog post on that. And when I wanted to help him out in developing proper mitigation guidance and using Device Guard or App Defender Application Control to block that. I couldn't do it 
because it didn't include the original file name and uh, file version in its resource. It did happen to have other things populated, like file description was in there. I think it had internal name. And so actually when you, um, a new feature now of new CI policy is you can do, no, it's not that one. It's, um, let me tab through here. specific file name level. So the default is to base the rule off original file name and file version. But if original file name is not there, but populated with something else like internal name, you can now build a rule based on that. So you can build it based off file description, file path, internal name, original file name, package family name. This only applies to uh, uh, modern apps. And product name. So in the case of Teams, Microsoft Teams, if my memory serves me correctly, I had to build my rule based on product name because there were components of the installation um, that did not have original file name applied, but product name was consistently applied. And so I used that as the basis for my file publisher rule. So that's a great feature that, that they added there in response to, um, to Matt Nelson's finding, which could not at the time be effectively mitigated against using Defender Application Control. Matt Nelson is awesome. Love that guy. For the record. Okay, so that's why Comrade uh, we couldn't create a, a file rule, a file publisher rule for that. Uh, we also can't do that for, we can't create file publisher rules for MSIs. MSIs don't have the same uh, kind of file metadata as the version info resource that you can embed in a uh, portable executable file. So with MSI files and script files, you're, le you're effectively left with um, just a handful of options. You can allow them by signer, right? So just broad signer rules, that's perfectly acceptable, by hash or by file path, all right? Unfortunately, there's significantly less granularity with the rules that you create uh, for script code and MSI installers, all right? So now you know. All right. Um, did my last, did I run this last thing? I don't remember. All right. So let's copy this and create that. Um, okay. Create that policy. This should just take a second. All right. Let's make some sense of what we got here so far with our policies. Um, cause I'm a nerd. I'm just gonna like visually organize these. I have a better way to do this once you start creating lots of these policies. Um, and we'll cover that in a later, uh, stream. So we have VMware tools user. So let me call this uh, driver. This was the driver policy that we created last time. I'm going to delete this. All right, so, sorry, this, all right, base policy and our three supplemental policies that we're going to merge into our base policy, okay? Now, the only other thing that we did not account for were the, um, um, Bear with me, the, uh, the C runtime library code here. Okay. Um, so I didn't account for that. And I think what I, let's see, what should I do to account for those? Um, I could go, 
conveniently. I, I have a, a document for that. Um, but what I did here was I, I took the uh, Visual C runtime uh, redistributable installer, ran package inspector on it, and then used the output list as the basis for that because like th those things got copied like all over system 32. So, um, you know what, in the interim, since we're getting a little short on time, um, I'm just gonna copy these to a temp directory, C, C runtime, and I'll just copy those individual ones over there. Uh, C runtime. My primary goal at this point is uh, completing this policy uh, in time. VCP 140, so that you all can can think that I'm that I'm cool. C runtime and. Uh, VC runtime 140. All right. Now I'll point get system driver to those to the C runtime path. Um, user PEs, we want that. We don't need a shadow copy. Let that run. That shouldn't take very long. And then I'm going to want to do a quick sanity check and validate that this only returned three results, three files that are user mode code. What's our count here? Okay, we have three. User mode is true for the first one. Scrolling up, true. True, true. Okay. All right, so these are indeed considered uh, user mode files. All right. So now let's do new CI policy. Uh, driver files, files, file path. We'll call this C runtime dot XML. And for the level, I like file publisher. And let's let that go. And that worked, fortunately. That means they're all properly signed and have the, uh, the expected file version info, namely uh, file version and original file name. Okay, so here we go. Let's, let's run with this, okay? So let's start building this out. Merge CI policy. We're gonna stomp on our old merged policy. Policy pass. Remember, we need to be specific about the first policy that we specify for the reasons stated earlier. And then we can go through our list. GVim, VMware driver, VMware tools user and c runtime dot xml all right real quick sanity check of things here oh i think we're doing good on time because what i'd like to do is deploy this policy still in audit mode and then place it into enforcement mode and see if uh, Windows bricks or not. Okay. This is where things start to get exciting. All right, doing it live. All right, um, binary file path. So let's go ahead and deploy this, see Windows. System 32, code integrity, SI policy. All right. And then we got to use that um, WMI 
Voodoo Magic, where was that? To refresh our policy. Screw that. All right. So that deployed and refreshed successfully. And now the test, the initial test here is um, we could run Vim in true hacker style. Let's exit Vim. Let's see, what else can we do? Is there any like VMware stuff that we can try to do here? Maybe not, I don't know. Um, but here, let's just do a quick check of the code integrity log. So get wdag code integrity event. Let's just look at our user mode code since last policy refresh. And we got nothing. I mean, I ran Vim, uh, but we did previously confirm that Vim was excluded from the code integrity log. Um, do I have a Vim plugin? Sonny asks. Uh, no, I don't. I'm such a noob. I don't even like know how to how to use those. So that 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 would be a good check. But oh hey, well here here's a good check. Let's just download random crap from the internet and see if it generates a log. Uh, one of my favorites is Putty. No no OJ don't don't try to look that up. Let let's not go there. <laughs> We're we're short on time here. I don't I don't want anyone else to screw up my uh, my stunt hacking demo here. Is it called stunt hacking if we're doing this in the interest of defense? Okay. All right. So putty ran. There we go. So we have a single code integrity event uh, for PuTTY. We obviously did not account for that in our policy. So uh, as expected, this shows up as an audit event. All right, cool. So here's how we're gonna wrap things up. All right, we're going to, I'm just gonna edit this by hand since it's easy. Take our merge policy and Remove audit mode from this uh, bad boy, bad girl, and deploy that. Because why the hell not? All right, update our policy. Okay, that failed to run. Um, the OS is uh, still chugging along, which is kind of cool. Um, let me let's let's snag those snag some new audit events. Okay, so we got Putty, and it is indeed being enforced now. What else? Yeah, we got Putty again. Putty, Putty. And uh, all right, here we go. Just like last time, moment of truth, people. Moment of truth. Let's restart. This is computer hacking at its best right here. So Sonny asks, how many events would it generate per block? Uh, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Not sure I'm following. Oh, you, like you're wondering how many enforcement events we would expect to see? Any, any guesses? Any bets? All right, so OJ asks, uh, am I understanding it right? If VM, if Vim fired up PuTTY, you'd still see an event. Absolutely, yes. Because it's loading via traditional Windows loader means, yes. And you would see that Vim indeed is the parent 
attempted parent process of uh of putty yep absolutely so very robust uh, enforcement mechanism here that we're talking about <clears throat> all right so well this is the, the error we expected from windows terminal that is not code integrity related Hey, uh, okay, so, oh, cool. All right, so problem solved from before. Um, PowerShell is now indeed in running in constrained language mode. And some of the code in my PowerShell profile uh, do things that are not allowed in constrained language mode. So um, that portion of the code is not gonna run uh, what I would have to do is create an allow rule for my PowerShell profile, or just remove that code if it, if I'm if I find that to be acceptable. All right, uh, but so far so good. Um, and again, I believe this works in constrained language mode. Pretty sure I validated that. It certainly should, since we should be able to audit events. Yeah, while while in while we're enforcing user mode code integrity. All right, what do we got for the count? Zero, no way. That is, uh, that is impressive. So uh, just as a sanity check, let's try to run putty here. Validate that we got an event. Sure enough, we do. Um, I'm I'm not sure why multiple fire. So process ID is the same. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure to be honest why three events were fire in that case. Um, question you may have had is, okay, if you saw the error surface. Oh, three different policy goods. Mm, is that the case? Um, so this one, the A two four four, A two four four. I should only have one because I merged everything into a single policy. In this case, so yeah, I don't, I don't know, to be honest. I wonder if this has to do. No. I, I don't I don't know to be honest um, so anyway um, that's cool like that's been enforced it's logged you may be wondering hey this PowerShell profile was not allowed to run why did that not get logged the reason is because script based code so PowerShell uh, Windows script host in other words VB script J script and MSI's are captured in the app locker code integrity or in the app locker event log. So kind of odd that that's the case, um, but there's no kernel enforcement of um, MSIs and script code. Like that's all done in user mode. And so that's where the team at Microsoft decided that those events should go. Um, so I have a script to automate pulling those out as well. We'll call this script events. So it's a get WDAC, I think scripts, what's it called? App locker script MSI event. Okay, yeah. So there might be some noise from earlier in here. We don't have the luxury of there being a dedicated event pointing to um, when the policy was refreshed in the app locker log. So you might have some noise in here, but this actually isn't too bad. So let me just break, let me just extract the file path here so we can make a little more sense of this. Sort the unique entries and yeah, I mean, this looks, that's super clean. So this would be a case where I would go through and I would have to decide, 
all right, in my environment, um, am I going to want to sign these or should I just um, create an allow rule for these scripts based on hash? Easiest thing to do would just be to do it by hash. Um, but that's under the assumption that I'm not going to be updating these all the time. Like, again, we really want to reduce the maintenance burden and not have tons of policies that rely on, <clears throat> on file hash rules if we can avoid it. Um, but that's really all there is to it. Um, and like last time, just on time, we did it live. We built our driver policies from last week. We rebuilt it uh, this week as well. And we built all of our user policies uh, within the course of just under two hours. Uh, and that incorporates me walking you through all this. So um, I hope that you're starting to see that this can be doable, uh, especially in an environment where you have ideally consistent hardware and a consistent software baseline to realistically be able to scale this out. Um, but um, if that's not the case, like that's, that's okay too. Like you could also start with a broader policy and just deploy this in audit mode as a means of supplementing um, your detection optics. All right. So uh, yeah, that's pretty much all I got now. Uh, are, are there any last minute questions that y'all have? Or would you rather just shower me with compliments because uh, I managed to do this twice in a row now, like successfully stream and uh, manage to get these in enforcement mode within the span of two hours. So please shower me with all that praise. I appreciate that. <laughs> Cool. So um, yeah, unless there are any questions, <laughs> Matt is God. Yes, that's exactly what I needed to hear. Yes. Um, so yeah, that was, well, that was fun to me. I know it was fun to you. Um, it must have at least been a little bit of fun since some of you are still hanging out with me. Either, either you just like me that much or like you actually care about Defender Application Control. So uh, or a combination thereof. Either way, um, really grateful that all of you could join and keep engaged with me. I really want to keep this up. Um, it's because of you that I want to keep doing this, that you're expressing that interest, that you're asking good questions. Um, so let's, um, let's, let's keep doing this together. Uh, Sonny, so yeah, you had a, a question here. Did I dive into memory stuff with Defender uh, Exploit Guard, Exploit Protection? Um, I have a little bit, yes. Um, I did a blog post, uh, like a joint blog post with Palantir um, not too long ago. So let, let me just pull that up as a last minute thing. If, if you are interested in seeing what uh, optics are available when deploying Defender Exploit Guard, uh, you, you have an option here. Oh, you saw that, Sonny? Okay, yeah. So, um, yep, good good reference. If you really want to get into the nitty-gritty events that can be populated in the event log when you're deploying Defender Exploit Guard. All right, cool. Thanks, Hal Green. Yeah, gl glad you enjoyed it, and uh, yeah, hope to, hope to see you next time. Um, so Sonny's asking, did I check out bin skim? No, I have no idea what what that is. Um, is that kind of like similar to package inspector for like auditing installations? Oh, by the way, someone mentioned to me last week, um, uh, what is the Microsoft utility for doing these audits? Uh, Attack Surface Analyzer is freaking awesome. Um, and I want to spend more time looking at that. Attack Surface Analyzer will report like uh, much more extensively what the overall installation uh, like attack surface is from a file perspective, uh, I think like a network connection perspective, registry, and so on and so forth. Um, it's, it's really sweet. Um, yeah. So 
Let's see, mild saucy. Let's say we are crazy and want to kill some lol baz with W dag. Oh yes, thank you for mentioning that. So what I did not account for here was mitigating against uh, lol bins, right? So my policy allowed any Windows code to run. Well, there's a lot of abusable Windows code in box. Things like MS build is what stands out to me immediately as a Windows signed utility that permits arbitrary unsigned code execution subverting Defender application control. So what I would like to do in a future stream is show you how to properly integrate um, block rules into a policy um, so that we can start to mitigate against those those bypasses. So I meant to mention that in the stream, but thank you again, Mild Saucy, for, for bringing that up. So if you search for um, uh, Microsoft recommended, I think, block rules, this is great. So they maintain this um, pretty actively. And uh, as an attacker, actually, like I would, I would subscribe to like get emails whenever this documentation is updated um, to get like the latest and greatest information on like what some of the um, good lull bins are that actually evade uh, Defender application control. So yeah, again, in a future stream, we'll cover how to consume this and merge this into our policy so that we can block all this crap from uh, from running as well and uh, evading our, our policy, all right? So again, thanks for that. And uh, I will leave it at that. Again, thanks everyone for, for joining. Um, you are really making this possible for me to continue my, my motivation to, to return to this. So I'll see you all next week. Take care.